Welcome to Caleb Can't Read. I'm Jordan Rabel. I'm Caleb Terrence. We have just been in a mood for soul music tonight, haven't uh, we? Yeah, I guess so. We've just been ripping on Lil Richard and James yeah, Brown. Don't, fucking... don't force it now. I'm not. I'm just don't saying. Don't make me do the I'm bits. about to. I'm about to. Uh, to like just bring you on to a whole different genre, though. Are you ready, kids? I, I have to be. I can't hear you. No, I'm not doing that. Oh, I don't participate in cringe bits. Who makes a living getting down on his knees? What? Caleb Terrence. <laughs> Did you, it's only impressive if you have the rest. <laughs> Give me a week. I can make a whole fucking song about you. You need a being, week, you need a week <laughs> to do that. Mail I can, if we pause this right now, I could turn that into I, I could do that in like 20 minutes. You want to do it? So get on the floor and lap up my piss. No, no, no. come on. <laughs> No. <laughs> Let's get We're on. Not... All right. Let's get on with it. All right. Got a pizza coming. Exactly. Well, let's get started then, shall we? Yeah. If, <clears throat> if it needs to be your idea, then sure. Go on. <laughs> Proceed. All right. I'm not, all right. I'm not doing it anymore. All right. Okay. Okay. William Topaz McGonagall was born sometime in March of 1825, somewhere in Ireland, to Charles and Margaret McGonagall. Supposedly, he was named after William Shakespeare, giving him a shadowed legacy that he would chase for his entire life. For the first 15 years of William's life, the McGonagall family would move several times throughout the British Isles in search of work. You see, the entire McGonagall family, the unspecified number of William's siblings, was a family of weavers, you know, using a loom and whatnot to create blankets, yep. curtains, whatever. God, have you ever done that shit? <clears throat> no, but I've seen a loom in your home, so... It is terrible. It is so hard. It is so tedious. It takes so fucking long. Why Why would somebody look at that and be like, yeah, it seems fun. <laughs> I don't know. Because you need clothes? <laughs> like, wow, that's fucking sad. You have no idea how poor I've been. <laughs> <laughs> the moths are eating them again. Anyway, the Industrial Revolution was booming, with new automatic machines making their work more and more obsolete every year. So anywhere the McGonagalls traveled for work would only keep them busy for so long before they would inevitably be among the many laid off. Eventually, sometime around 1840, the family would finally settle down in the coastal town of Dundee, Scotland. You see, on top of its booming whaling community was also the town's specialty in producing jute, which is a thick fiber mostly used to create burlap sacks. Mm. However, the fiber was tough enough that it would overwork the machines, so progress was slow going, and oftentimes there would need to be actual people on the production line to help speed things along. As a matter of fact, Dundee was cheekily known as the home of jute, jam, and journalism. Why are you looking at me like that? Isn't that cute? Yeah, I, I guess, man. <laughs> now, William was a proud Scotsman, even though he was actually Irish. He claimed his whole life that he was born in the Scottish capital of Edinburgh, even though that wasn't true. He also told everyone he was born in 1830 instead of 1825, effectively making himself five years younger than he really was. Is he a compulsive liar? Because that seems like <laughs> it seems like there's no reason for that. What you you really just tell them what weight you really are on your ID? I don't care. You don't. I don't. I haven't looked at the license, weight of my ID in a while because <laughs> no, I'm one of the only arborists in the area without a DUI. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, don't get pulled over because you don't have a fucking license for that thing. But sometimes I will look at the license, see the weight, and then look at what I am now and be like, ooh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, well, that's a stark contrast from three weeks ago. You remember when we went to that 7-Eleven together and then, like, the guy asked for my ID? Of course, I handed him my ID for my beer purchase. And then he just went, like looked at it and was like, ooh. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, wow, that's an old ID. And I was just like, thanks, dick. <laughs> like, what the hell? You slap him with your purse? <laughs> Anyway, whatever schooling William was having, he quit to learn the family trade, as he was not just a proud Scotsman, but a proud weaver as well. Well, it didn't take him long to learn how to loom shit, but since he'd already quit school, that was it for him. He was a worker now, not a student. So he continued his education on his own, mostly delving into the cheap collections he could find of his namesake, William Shakespeare. While he was at work, 
He'd keep everyone entertained by reciting monologues from Shakespeare's works completely memorized. Oh, I'm sure they fucking loved him. Honestly, fucking maybe. There, that's a lot of work to go through, and it's like, somebody turn on the ra- Oh, that's not- The tell- No, fuck. Yeah, never mind. I, 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 uh, <laughs> I take might, back my sarcasm. You might as well go for it. <laughs> like, like, yeah. All right, do Hamlet again, you fuck. <laughs> Well, while, so while he was at work, he would do this, and this impressed his co-workers so much that they actually pooled money together to give to a local theater owner and bribe the guy into letting William play the title role of Macbeth in the upcoming play. That may have been, I mean, depending on how you're looking at it, that could have been, like, in jest. You know, like, we gotta get this motherfucker on stage. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, 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 don't tell, don't tell, it'll be good. <laughs> it's gonna oh, be- him? Yeah, he's the only Shakespearean actor we know, actually. <laughs> it will be fantastic, in a way. Look, if you're uh, if you're just gonna put another pile of jute up there and yell the lines from the side, you might as well have this guy up there. <laughs> now, for those of you, you specifically, Caleb, Talk who off. may not know... The ending of Macbeth is when he's decapitated by the vengeful Macduff. However, while I'm sure the play went just fine up until this point, no one was reporting on anything except the ending of this play in particular because William thought the guy playing Macduff was jealous of his acting skills and thought he was trying to upstage him. So when the time came to behead Macbeth, William just straight up refused to fucking die. (laughs) He didn't want to die by the bastard's hand on stage. Oh, I'm a little bit disappointed. I was like thinking like, oh, so we actually beheaded him. I was like, this is going to be an awesome episode, but never mind. (laughs) Yeah, switching complete lanes over to that guy now. (laughs) On July 11th, 1846, William Topaz McGonagall married a mill worker named Jean King at the age of 21. She was the same age. Or I guess he was 16, if you believe him about when he was born. They would go on to have eight children, William Jr. in 1846, Margaret in 1846, Joseph in 1854, Charles in 1857, Mary in 1860, James in 1863, John in 1865, and Thomas in 1870. So they're Catholic? (laughs) Well, Jesus Christ, for a Scotsman, he sure multiplies like he's Irish. Between his seventh and eighth children, on October 18th, 1865, William's father, Charles, passed away. His mother, Margaret, passed a mere seven years after while residing in a poorhouse, on November 10th, 1872. Like most of his life before his career, we're not sure what effect this had on Will, but we do know where his story truly begins. In June of 1877, at the age of 47, he was losing his work as a loomer, as the technological updates were getting ever better at replicating a human's work, even for jute. Because, like, there isn't, like, a little, like, reenactment for it somewhere that he can go work. Yeah, I mean, pretty much if they automate all the tellers at, like, a Walmart, they're still just going to need only one guy around to kind of kick the machine when it's down. Well, they're going to need more than one, but they're only going to hire one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) On top of that, one of his daughters had had uh, a child out of wedlock, disgracing the McGonagall name. His life was in a free fall. But then, something happened. What a disgrace. Something amazing happened. William Topaz McGonagall had a midlife crisis. Quote, It's not really amazing. I've seen it. (laughs) (laughs) I've had two already. I'm only 30. For for me, I feel like (sighs) might be accurate. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Quote, I imagined that a pen was in my right hand and a voice crying, write, write. And write he did. His first poem entitled An Address to the Reverend George Gilfillan. George Gilfillan was a minister and sometimes writer living not too far from Dundee at the time. Now, please, <clears throat> no interruptions for this momentous occasion. All right, hang on. Let me get another beer. The poem is a bit lengthy, but you truly need to see how wonderful this man's poetry is. <clears throat> Ooh, I'm sensing that that's... All right. Well, and... Proceed. All hail to the Reverend George Gilfillan of Dundee. He is the greatest preacher I did ever hear or see. He is a man of genius bright, and in him his congregation does delight, because they find him to be honest and plain, affable in temper, and seldom known to complain. He preaches in a plain, straightforward way. The people flock to hear him night and day, and hundreds from the doors are often turned away, because he is the greatest preacher of the present day. He has written the life of Sir Walter Scott, 
and while he lives, he will never be forgot, nor when he is dead, because by his admirers it will be often read, and fill their minds with wonder and delight, and while away the tedious hours on a cold winter's night. He has also written about the bards of the Bible, which occupied nearly three years in which he was not idle, because when he sits down to write, he does it with might and main. Fox is another page. And to be <laughs> and to get an interview with him, it would be almost vain. And in that, he is always right. And for the Bible tells us, whatever your hands findeth to do, do it with all your might. Reverend George Gilfillan of Dundee, I must conclude my muse, and to write in praise of thee my pen does not refuse, nor does it give me pain to tell the world fearlessly that when you are dead, they shall not look upon your like again. Okay, how'd you one, like it? <laughs> one, one. It sounds like when Data tries to do poetry in Next Gen, and two, I understood that, which means therefore it is bad. You're exactly right on both of those points. <laughs> <laughs> when the Reverend George Gilfillan received this poem, he sent a letter back to William stating, "Quote: Shakespeare never wrote anything like this." Clearly a jab at Will's writing abilities, or lack thereof, William took it as a compliment and a clear sign that he should start his new career as a poet. I love this man's poet. confidence. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's what this whole story is about, is fucking confidence. Yeah! <laughs> well, this, <clears throat> for most people, would be seen as a hearty first attempt at a poem. William was special because there was no evidence that he felt he ever needed more than one draft at anything. And he would never get any better either. Oh, was he one of those people that thought he was, you know, smarter than whatever advice people gave him? Essentially, yeah. Those are really annoying artists. Yes, but... He's, he's like, hey, he's man, not, maybe stop and think that there's a reason people do things this way. Yeah, he's like, not He's not going to be pompous in the way that it makes people angry, though. <laughs> I'll put it that way. With no rhythm, metaphors, or a lengthy vocabulary, and only believing that the points of poems is that they have to rhyme, William McGonagall was just beginning his career as the wo- worst poet in history. Now, sure, you can write... That's po- a little harsh. Uh, it is very true. It is... Uh, I, I'll get to that later. <laughs> Look, okay, man, all right, I all right. I bought his com- collected poems thinking that it was going to be fucking funny, and I did oh. not get very far into it before I was like, "This feels like every page is the same joke. This is just oh, so it's pure so bad. Ass. It's not even enjoyable. It's boring too. It's funny and that's short the worst bursts. kind of. Ass. It's funny and short bursts. <laughs> but that was the thing is that especially poems back in the day, man, they were pretty lengthy, and so he would continue writing about a war. And it's just plain bad. (laughs) It's really fucking bad. (laughs) Now, sure, you can write and publish shit on your own as a writer. Do all the backbreaking bullshit it takes to self-publish. Or you can get yourself a patron. Basically, what it is, is you'd have someone paying your bills for you while you're working on your writings. And then if your work gets published, maybe they take a cut of the profits. It's kind of like um, having your investment in an artist. Remember when James Joyce was writing Finnegan's Wake for 17 years on that one lady's dime? Mm-hmm. That that was his patron. So it's, it's like being sponsored? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So McGonagall figured, if he's the next motherfucking Shakespeare, why not have your patron be the one person sitting at the tippity top? That's right. He was going to ask for patronage from Queen Victoria herself. This is just, this is the <laughs> the writer equivalent of the dude that did the room, huh? <laughs> Right? More confidence than is actually necessary. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Now, the letter he ended up writing didn't even get to the queen. Instead, it was intercepted by an aide who read the letter first. No, queen! (laughs) (laughs) I mean, of course it was. No, it's really bad, but it's really boring, too. Don't read it. I'm sure there were tons of crazies sending her shit just like people do for politicians today. Anyway, the queen's aide read William's letter, of course spelled out in a wonderful poem, and sent a rejection letter back, essentially saying, thank you for your consideration. But Balmoral obviously hitched a ride or something, especially since the terrain between Balmoral Castle and Dundee is mountainous. And also there were violent thunderstorms his entire journey there. (laughs) But William is a man of little sense and fierce bravado. So he walked the entire 60 miles with the idea that Queen Victoria would love to hear an upfront and personal performance of Man, his. Man, I, I really personally empathize with that lack of foresight and impulsivity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I've got a soft spot for this That's kid. A... <laughs> yeah, I kind of look at the city and I'm just sh- like, oh, she wants you to keep texting her. Cool, cool, cool. I, I, <laughs> I've like, I have like literally had to walk back from Boring, Oregon to Portland, Oregon before. So, like, yeah, about the same track, honestly. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> We're in the Portland area, so of course it was storming and. Yeah, we got got to go through them West Hills. It's you like know, raining it's like... sideways. I haven't slapped them hungover, and we're walking. Maybe, maybe the fucking pentagram back patch with made out of naked women was not a good idea for putting your thumb out. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, I remember trying to hitch in the just just bleeding ass rain, and I just remember it was so cold that eventually I started feeling pretty warm, and I'm just like, uh oh, <laughs> like that's never good when you start feeling warm. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, now I can't feel it. <laughs> this is great. Boy, I'm sweating. I really ought to well, take off so, this jacket. If I'm so comfortable, I should probably just go lie down for a while <laughs> and go climb that tree. I've been working pretty hard. I deserve a rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the water's pretty warm. I'll just lay down in the puddle. <laughs> the water's great, too. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, once McGonagall made it to the castle, he was stopped by a guard who asked him who he was. Proudly, McGonagall announced himself as the Queen's Poet. And the guard's like... That's not a thing. <laughs> he's, uh, no, it actually is. But he's what? like, dude, you're not the Queen's fucking poet. Fucking Tennyson is. Referencing, of course, Lord Alfred Tennyson, one of history's most famous poets. Happened to be a, uh, you know... Oh, what's that word I'm looking for? A uh, collaborator. What is it? Don't don't dig around in my vernacular for that, brother. You must search. He for lived them. at the same time as this man. So, <laughs> <laughs> wait, what was it? Fuck, I don't know it either. God damn it, we're gonna just, we're gonna derail the whole thing, Jordan. Keep going. No, God pause damn. it. Hang on. No, no. Ah! Okay, contemporaries. 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 Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, a strong moment for either of us. <laughs> it's sad that you got it. I was like, oh damn, man, I'm I'm losing it. I don't know the definition, I just know it in the context what just you means have that said. You, it, you live at the same time as the fella. That's, that's it? it. Yeah. It doesn't even have anything to do with your trade or No. Really? Not really. Oh, okay. Whatever. I'm technically a contemporary of Osama bin Laden, but we don't need to delve <laughs> into that. <laughs> Wait. What? Okay. <laughs> okay, no, 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 pause again. Yeah, you're right, all right. Okay, on. yeah, no, 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 it's good that you Googled that, because if I'm going to start putting Jordan Rabel, a contemporary to Osama Bin Laden, on my resume, <laughs> I need to make sure it's professionally You don't want to seem like you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, <clears throat> Well, the guard clearly didn't understand who he was talking to, so McGonagall showed him the proof of his rejection letter. Well, that didn't work either, so unfortunately, William had to hike the 60 miles back home. <clears throat> now, William was a member of the International Organization of Good Templars, which was basically a group of people who hated drinking and drugs, and rather than keeping it to themselves, decided everyone should follow their lead. He would often spread the word of the Good Templars by walking into pubs and reciting poems about the evils of alcohol. Oh my god, that's... <clears throat> okay. Were they okay? I know everybody over there is like real stabby. Were they back then too? Because that's a real easy way to get. No, I, you know, I don't know. Like you go in and start irritating him. a no, bunch no, of no. drunk people. He's he's going to get a different kind of rejection, which kind of makes him famous. Now, <clears throat> here's a poem of his. <laughs> Just pee on his leg or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only. So here's one of many. Quote. O oh, thou demon drink, thou fell destroyer, thou curse of society and its great. Annoyer, what hast thou done to society? Let me think. I answer, thou hast caused the most of ills, thou demon drink. Thou causest the mother to neglect her child, also the father to act as he were wild, so that he neglects his loving wife and family dear by spending his earnings foolishly on whiskey, rum, and beer. After spending his earnings foolishly, he beats his wife. (laughs) Go on. Sorry, left field. (laughs) The man that promised to protect her during life. And so the man would, if there was no drink in society, for seldom a man beats his wife in a state of sobriety. Okay, okay. I am no hey, longer I'm, in this man's one, corner. One last, one last stanza here. And if he does, perhaps he finds his wife foul. Then that causes, no doubt, a great hullabaloo. It doesn't rhyme when he finds his wife one thing you do dude when he finds his wife make it rhyme. when he finds his wife drunk he begins to frown and in a fury of passion he knocks her down (laughs) 
Okay. <laughs> so he's just wandering into bars and being like, you all beat your wives. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh my god, nobody beat him up or peed on his leg. They just did what we're doing now. They cracked the fuck up. Yeah, like, yeah they did. No, also, no, 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 no. No, if you beat your wife, you beat your wife. <laughs> what? Like, no, no, that's that's such a bad message because it's like, no, 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 no. If he's beating his wife when he's drinking, him cleaning up and being sober isn't going to change that. He's going to beat well, his fucking <laughs> wife when he's stressed, period. Well, as like, he said, they re- he, uh, he, he would... She would barely do it if he was in a state of sobriety, you know, just barely. <laughs> just barely. Oh yeah. yeah, every every time you need a walloping, you know. But like, I I just oh yeah, that imagine... was really commonplace then, right? It's commonplace now. <laughs> like, mm. Not as much. I'm sh- oh, yeah, fuck. I don't know. Do you hang out with anybody that beats their fucking wife? God, I hope not. <laughs> like, yeah, no, dude. Like, I fucking hope not. No, there's fucking consequences for that. I mean, it's a problem, but in no fucking way is it like written into law that you, you know, back then. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really happy that out of all the alcoholics in my family, that I know for a fact none of them beat their wives because they they were all raised with a very dire like you don't touch a woman, you don't do this, you don't do like you know. It's all very so when one of my ex aunts chased my uncle with a shotgun he did not defend himself <laughs> he just he's just like all right well you know <laughs> now I, I understand your side i made a misstep here <laughs> <laughs> now because his poetry was so piss poor people oftentimes actually enjoyed his performances at pubs as a source of entertainment but as the e- <laughs> as the evil drunks are naturally unpredictable would sometimes find william's presence irksome people would occasionally throw food at him peas eggs fish on at least one occasion but for some goddamn inexplicable reason that's a really good move if for some reason probably because while he was getting pelted with food people were laughing and cheering (laughs) and god knows they couldn't be making fun of his poetry he took this as a sign of celebration for his work that people were throwing food at him I mean, well, well, gosh, golly, they're just so happy about it. I mean, the guy was so narcissistic that anyone who criticized his work was just plain ill educated to him. For instance, one time the chief Templar for the International Organization of Good Templars was just like, dude, your shit sucks. How are you this fucking blind? And McGonagall just laughed it off and told him, quote, <laughs> oh, yes, it was so very bad that Her Majesty had thanked McGonagall for what the Chief Templar had condemned. Was that a quote? Yeah, he was referring to himself in the third person. Can I ask you about that? <laughs> yep. He's just that fucking Talks contemptuous. Like, like, homie, you're talking like Dobby. Stop it. <laughs> it's not a good look. Like... <laughs> he's just out there with fucking mashed potato in his bangs just like <laughs> I'm brilliant <laughs> this is fucking amazing the man's a fucking muppet <laughs> this is a this is a good one <laughs> I'm like, glad that we could do like this him. while we're just getting hammered too <laughs> <laughs> now McGonagall believing himself to just absolutely be the shit offered his local newspapers the opportunity to print his poems. At this point, he was quite the well-known local character. He had made a job of selling his poems in the street to some success because people wanted to know what the latest failure of a poem was going to be. And the newspapers, knowing exactly who William McGonagall was because of this, jumped on it. For instance, (laughs) one of his poems was about the local Tay Bridge. You see, the Tay Bridge goes almost three miles over a body of wadi. Oh, body, body of wadi. Over a body of wadi. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> show me a body of wadi. Over a body of water called the Firth of Tay, connecting the town of Dundee to a town called Wormit across the way. A Firth, by the way, is pretty much just a river, but Scottish. That's fucking sick. We should do interesting <laughs> podcasts like how they built that shit or something like I don't think it's that interesting. <laughs> that sounds actually, interesting as fuck to actually, me. What are you this, talking about? This one is going to be a little bit interesting because of what happens a little later. Now, anyway, the the Tay Bridge opened on June 1st, 1878, and to commemorate its beauty, William McGonagall, of course, wrote a poem. <laughs> a section of it reads was as he, follows. Was he asked to, to do this? You are graced with his presence. Excuse <laughs> you. <laughs> Quote, Beautiful railway bridge on the silvery Tay. I hope that God will protect all passengers by night and by day, and that no accident will befall them while crossing. 
the bridge of the Silvery Tay, for that would be the most awful thing to be seen nearby Dundee and the Magdalene Green. Is that it? Yes. Let's well, I mean, it. that's that's just a portion Can we of make it. a YouTube channel where we rap extremely whitely that? <laughs> I think that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> the Tay Bridge itself was designed by well-known architect Thomas Booch. After Queen Victoria rode a train across the bridge, she knighted Thomas Booch for his exemplary work. In the making of the bridge, plans for how the steel girders were to be fitted changed something like three times before it was completed. Now, Dundee is known as a very windy city. Think of the uh, mountainous terrain on either side of the Firth of Tay, working the same as the West Hills here in Portland. You know, like, um, hey, actually, shit, yeah. Do not, do not. What? You do not want me to get into the issues of oh, the you've... West Hills in <laughs> Portland. So for anyone who's never flown into PDX, it's a, it's you can have the most seamless silky flight ever but flying into pdx basically we have hills around portland the west hills and it creates this big bull shape and it puffs the air up at such a fucking velocity that it will rattle the goddamn airplane so fucking bad and i i have on one occasion thought this is actually it like i am going to die here <laughs> like <laughs> our plane is crashing in portland right now so you know it's it's a, it's it's a bit windy, just as it is here on the Firth of Tay. Jordan, was our pizza here? Yeah, fuck yeah, it is. All right, <sighs> that was good pizza. That was amazing. So <laughs> good pizza and good donkey video. Yeah, it was. Let's get yeah. back to it. Well, so as I was saying before, <clears throat> the silvery Tay Bridge over the Firth of Tay, it it had a little bit of some construction issues in its making. When the safety inspectors gave the Tay Bridge a passing score. It was during three days in nothing but calm skies. One of the inspectors even said, quote, When again visiting the spot, I should wish, if possible, to have an opportunity of observing the effects of high wind when a train of carriages is running over the bridge. End quote. Perhaps if they had, the Tay Bridge disaster would have never happened. On the evening of December 28th, 1879, the winds were blowing 70 to 80 miles per hour. Holy shit. The only thing you could see... We don't get see, that kind of wind. No, dude. we do not. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe when you're in the airplane. The only thing you can see during the storm were the lights lining the sides of the bridge. Two signalmen, who were the guys that throw that switch back and forth that changes the tracks like in the movies, watched a train carrying like 70... Like real life, too. Yeah. I think it's all CGI. I've never seen a train in real life. It's bullshit. They watched a train carrying 70 passengers make their way to Dundee from their cabin. They later testified that they saw sparks get thrown from the train wheels before a bright flash of light lit up the sky and the bridge lights went out. Including the engineers on board, a total of 75 people had been killed in the bridge collapse. No survivors. Holy shit. The architect, Sir Thomas Bouch, or Booch, died the very next year in utter disgrace. But they did manage to salvage the locomotive at the bottom of the river to did be repaired. No, he just died. And it was like, he was old already. And it was like, well, this is the last bit of news I'll have before I'm dead. It was a good career, you know? Shit. And they did manage to salvage the locomotive at the bottom of the river to be repaired and put back into circulation. It was nicknamed the Diver and, of course, reportedly haunted. <laughs> For such a disaster... Who better to write their magnum opus on the subject than William McGonagall? Uh, it's not really funny anymore. <laughs> His most famous poem, The Tay Bridge Disaster, printed in local newspapers everywhere in 1880, and I won't read the whole thing, begins thus. Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, alas, I am very sorry to say that 90 lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879 which will be remembered for a very long time. Yeah. It's worth noting that he says 90 people died, although the real number is 75. He didn't need to change it for rhyming purposes or anything, so no one knows why he did that. Just He just <laughs> had make, make it worse. The guess. spirit took him. <laughs> like I'm an artist. And then this is how it ends. It must have been an awful sight to witness in the dusky moonlight when the storm fiend did laugh and angry did bray along the railway bridge of the Silvery Tay. Oh, 
ill-fated bridge of the Silvery Tay, I must now conclude my lay, by telling the world fearlessly without the least dismay, that your central girders would not have given way, at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on it on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses, for the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Wait, why didn't they do that? Did they, were they just trying to cut cost or something or speed it up? It it it, it was kind of it was kind of it was kind of as far as I could understand it, it was kind of a like a difference in contract like contracts were ending while certain ones were being picked up and you should be building like girders a certain way depending on what strength of steel you have and so they were changing plans up in the middle of it which had a different strength of steel and a different design with their third party basically they had like three different companies building a bridge together and I it did not work out I feel like what happened is they <laughs> fucking is, is they knew better and the architect didn't give a shit cuz he was old and about to retire it could be it very well could be, yeah. But I mean, the queen did ride across it like we, you know, <laughs> like he's just like, yeah, go. Fuck he's it. like the queen's here today. She, um, uh, what? <laughs> hey, man, are you excited? He like puts his finger up for the wind. Like, yeah, I think we're good. Like, <laughs> let that bitch roll. It'll probably stay up until I'm dead. <laughs> so I don't give a shit. <laughs> when the bridge was rebuilt, McGonagall gave that one a poem too. Beautiful in all capitals. New railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, with your strong brick piers and buttresses in so grand array, and your thirteen central girders, which seem to my eye strong enough all windy storms to defy. He really had a thing about the buttresses. I'm not sure why. <laughs> mm. Now, in 1880, William McGonagall... Well, he's, he doesn't have a fucking architect degree. He has no idea what the fuck yeah, he's talking about. Yeah, neither do we. Move along. I don't know what a buttress is. Don't, don't linger here. We don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 1880... William McGonagall, you don't know what my fucking degree was in, fuck you. It was in, what is it, history, right? I was a major. You're a history major? What was your degree? What'd you get? <laughs> associate of General Studies. Ooh, an associate? <laughs> you have an associate. You swing dick yeah. like an intellectual, you fuck. <laughs> God damn I pretty it. much went to the counselor, like, yeah, I'm thinking to quit in college, and they're like, actually, you have enough credits to graduate since, like, Dude, my ISA certification ago. is the, like, a fucking equivalent like, to an associate's. <laughs> Yeah, fuck out of like, here. I was like, sweet, I guess I'll take that then. <laughs> I fucking left. I was like, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> but I don't have the certification, so until then, swing away. <laughs> <laughs> Both of us know that neither one of us is swinging anything. <laughs> yeah, no. It's a pistol in the wind. <sighs> now, in 1880, William McGonagall went to England to, quote, seek his fortune. No idea what that meant. He had no business ventures out there. My best guess is maybe he thought he'd get into theater. Well, whatever it was, he soon returned, quote, unsuccessful. Now, nobody asked him to do this, of course, but when the University of Dundee was opened in 1883, William McGonagall commemorated the event with another famous poem that has since become one of his greatest hits. Good people of Dundee, your voices raise. And to Miss Baxter, give great praise. Rejoice and sing and dance with glee, because she has founded a college in Bonnie Dundee. In December of 1883, a large humpback whale was seen swimming in the Firth of Tay. Remember, Dundee is not only known for their jute, but their whaling community as well. Now, usually... Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Let's go kill it. <laughs> <laughs> now, usually the whaling boats would be out in the Arctic for the hunting season, but in the winter... Every whaler was back in Dundee. So when the humpback whale got spotted, four different towns were in on the hunt. The chase lasted all night after harpooning the animal all day. But the harpoon rope suddenly snapped and the whale made its escape. Unfortunately, the whale succumbed to its injuries and its corpse washed up on the shores a week later. The dissection was done there on the beach by anatomist Sir John Struthers and the remains of the whale were then put on tour by showman John Woods, who would let you see the carcass for a small admission fee. The Tay Whale by William McGonagall has been in hot contention with You've the... never seen a carcass this big. <laughs> nor smelled one, sir. Not sent your mother! <laughs> <laughs> the Tay Whale by William McGonagall has been in hot contention with the Tay Bridge disaster for worst poem ever made. But here, I'll give you a few snippets and let you be the judge. Oh, it was a most fearful and beautiful sight, to see it lashing the water with its tail all its might, 
and making the water ascend like a shower of hail, with one lash of its ugly and mighty tail. Then the water did descend on the men in the boats, which wet their trousers and also their coats, but it only made them more the more determined to catch the whale, but the whale shook at them his tail. Then the whale began to puff and to blow, while the men in the boats after him did go, armed with their harpoons for the fray, which they fired at him without dismay. And this is how it ends. So Mr. John Wood has bought it for 226 pound and has brought it to Dundee all safe and all sound, which measures 40 feet in length from the snout to the tail. So I advise the people far near to see it without fail. Uh. Then hurrah for the mighty monster whale, which has got 17 feet, four inches from tip to toe of a tail, and which can be seen for a sixpence or a shilling. That is to say, if the people all are willing. I just felt it was really fucking unnecessary to put the advertisement in on the end of it. Like, just, and you can see me down on Ash Street, and I'll be here pattering my feet. Yeah, like, oh, really, he is a first draftsman of all kinds. This is pretty bad. Like, it doesn't even get stuck in your head. No. <laughs> like, usually if you it, hear if something anything... obnoxious that rhymes, it gets stuck in your head, and you're like, God damn it, I hate that this job is a thing for people to do. But... No, it's it's kind of like the people who are in um who are in ice cream suits during the summer waving on for you to come to Cold Stone or Baskin Robbins and it's like, yeah, I'm more offended than anything. You know, and that's kind of what I'm, he became was like yeah. it's like you didn't like talking about the hunt for the whale, okay, you tried, but then you ended it with like and you can see him on Sundays. It'll be fun for all the family Lays, you know, like <laughs> Jesus, dude. <laughs> it just becomes offensive at some Especially point. Especially like when we got to like the words that were rhyming with whale, I was like, "Sick, dude, we're getting close to the end." But then he just kept going. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, tail, fail, rail, <laughs> fuck, <laughs> nail, <laughs> end this. Yeah, imagine having the book. <laughs> oh my god, dude! In 1887, he tried yet again to find his fortune. This time in New York. Again, no idea what the thought was, but he came back yet again, quote-unquote, unsuccessful. Well, it's been ten years since McGonagall started his journey as a poet, and since then work as a weaver has slowly has slowed to nearly a standstill. As much of a laughingstock as he was in town, he still had friends, all of which were willing to give him money when he was in a tight spot. However, he finally found a job where he could make it on his own, one lucrative enough to be paying him 15 shillings a night, all while performing his own poetry at the circus. Oh, okay. I have no idea how much 15 shillings is, by the way. I looked it up for you. I don't okay, know. Okay, so is he... <laughs> but he's making a day's wage to be a laughing stock. Is, is he like a good performer, at least? Like, No, he's just performing his poetry and people throw shit I at feel him. Like, <laughs> I feel like what happened to this guy is he learned to trade... And then when that became irrelevant and he could no longer support himself in the system, that he just kind of broke and couldn't face reality and then wouldn't face the fact that he couldn't do the poetry. Yeah, I mean, it's been 10 years of him doing this shit and he hasn't got any better. And I think at some point he had to have learned what throwing food at him was like and like knew what that was about. And he had to have been like, well, at least it's attention. You know, like as long as I'm bad, people will buy my poetry if it's mediocre no one cares you know and if it's great then i only attract the poets i feel like you're attributing a little too much thought to this <laughs> a little bit a little bit too much intention you know what i mean you're right you're right that's my bad i feel like he's just going he's, with it he's mcgonagall he like me throughout the day just 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 shoots his attention to anything moving quickly and goes on like there's got to be a reason his parents named his middle name topaz you know <laughs> just like <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fucking dead end child. Whoa. People what? Oh, People for <laughs> Go on, go on. Sorry, what was your middle name? I don't I have two. Shut up. <laughs> it's so white. People from all over would come to Dundee to not just see incredible feats, but listen to William McGonagall himself perform some of his greatest hits as well. And of course, in what William thought was just a weird Scottish tradition, people were encouraged to throw food. Sometimes it was such a good response to his work that he had to run and hide for cover as there was just too much food being thrown. And William was totally cool with all of this. But what put the shows to a stop were the city magistrates themselves who deemed the absolute avalanche of people coming to see McGonagall perform a safety hazard. 
And let me tell you, William was pissed. This is not food safe. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't understand why the man was bringing him down. They're taking away his audience, goddammit. So, of course, he wrote a poem about this, too. Wait, wait, wait. What was the reason that it wasn't safe? There's too many people. It was becoming like a fucking safety oh. haz- hazard, uh, hazard of people trampling. Like, oh, it was Jesus. just... Yeah, people were pushing to see, like, try and listen to this guy be absolute shit and throw a tomato at him. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Lines in Protest to the Dundee Magistrates. You suck so much, people are killing themselves to let you know how much they <laughs> suck. You have to stop, sir. People are dying to see how bad you are. <laughs> this isn't funny anymore, man. <laughs> like, Man, if only William Hung had this kind of success. You people know? are so excited <laughs> to throw tomatoes at you, they've trampled children <laughs> to get the chance. It's funny. Yes, but (laughs) it's still funny, of course. (laughs) Fellow citizens of Bonnie Dundee, are ye aware how the magistrates have treated me? Nay, do not stare or make a fuss when I tell ye they have boycotted me from appearing in Royal Circus. (laughs) 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 Which, in my opinion, is a great shame and a dishonor to the city's name. Fellow citizens, I consider such treatment to be very hard. Tis proof for me they have little regard, or else in the circumstances they would have seen to my protection. Then that would have been a proof of their affection, and how genius ought to be rewarded. But instead, my genius has been disregarded. It doesn't rhyme. Why should the magistrates try and punish me in such a cruel form? I never heard the like since I was born. Fellow citizens, they have taken me a part of my living, and as Christians, they should have been giving. But instead of that, they have prevented Baron Ziegler from engaging me, which certainly is a disgrace to Bonnie Dundee. (sighs) Ah, fuck. (laughs) Okay, Next Gen was definitely referencing this guy, actually. I don't think that was a passing. The what? Next Gen. You know, Star Trek Next Gen? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whenever Data does fucking poetry, it sounds exactly yep. like yep. that. Mm-hmm. That's the reference that I did not understand before. Thank you. Data's Jordan. the black guy. Yeah. Um, 100%. All right. See? Yep. Tip top of my game. Go ahead. <laughs> By the time he was 65, William McGonagall was completely broke. So in 1890, his friends pulled money together to help publish the large body of his work he had amassed. Poetic Gems was released in two volumes to quite a lot of success. However, the more widespread publication of his poems meant more people than ever harassing William in the streets. And the insults were a lot more blatant now. He knew people were being shitty. He just didn't know why people were doing this now after 13 years of nothing but admiration and success. It just didn't feel like the food being thrown at him was out of love anymore, you know? (laughs) Well, he wrote an angry poem to the people at Dundee, publishing it in the newspaper, saying that if their attitudes didn't change, he'd be leaving town. (laughs) I'm going to dig deeper. (laughs) One of the newspapers replied, saying that he'd probably stay another year once he finds out that 1893 rhymes with Dundee. They were correct. (laughs) Holy shit. That's fucking good. (laughs) That's so sad. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's fucking funny. I mean, it couldn't have been like, I'm going to leave Dundee in 1892. And you'll never see me either. Oh, fuck. Like, <laughs> the shit. Well, I guess I got to stay on here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got another seven fucking months. All right. Well, time to go out there and make a crowd. The McGonagall family floated around Scotland for a bit more uh, before finally settling down. Oh my god, those poor kids just like looking up at their dad and being like, dude, 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 please, no. (laughs) Can you imagine they have the exact same rhyme scheme too? Would you say your name was Jerry uh, Mabonable? Oh, weird. That doesn't mean anything in our language, but huh. Scottish, huh? Yep. Mm. Huh. (laughs) Where was I? Oh, Oh, there we are. (laughs) So his family settled down in Edinburgh, the Scottish capital, and what William claimed to be his birthplace in 1895 when he was 70 years old. At some point, a letter was sent to William from somebody claiming to be the king of Burma. The letter was to inform William that he had been knighted and inducted into the holy order of the white elephant. Oh man, are they going to do a joke and humiliate him? Despite everyone trying to convince him it was a hoax, William would go on to cite himself in every letter for the rest of his days, 
Sir William Topaz McGonagall, Knight to the White Elephant, Burma. Dude. <laughs> they even gave him, like, a little fucking, uh, like, ivory elephant from, like, a gift shop or something. Sent him a- and he fucking held on to that thing Sent like it was a badge. Sent him an honorary degree from Clown College. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> like, yeah. Jesus, man. Like... <laughs> God, this is kind of tragic. <laughs> like, this is really <laughs> fucked up. And now, like, fucking, we're, like, in 2021 dogging on the guy still, and it, it kind of <laughs> makes me sad. Honestly, I feel, I, I feel kind of bad about this guy. Look, man, I have a Shags record, and <laughs> when I have grandchildren, like, they're going dog- to get that. We've like- dogged on pieces of shit before, but this fucking just fool. But he dies happy. I think, I, maybe. Dude, I don't... Oh, my God. In his old age, William was no longer able to walk the streets in his feeble health <laughs> to sell his work. And being kept afloat by friends can only work for so long. In McGonagall's case, it was nearly all his life. For a time, you could hire him for parties, so you could have your very own concert of his work, and of course get more confrontational with him up close. It was for sure the saddest part of his life. Unfortunately... He died in the streets of Edinburgh, penniless, on September 29th, 1902, at the age of 77. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Greyfriars Kirkyard Cemetery, and as far as I could tell, his wife, Jean King, was with him when he passed. She would follow nine years later, at the age of 86, on February 24th, 1911, and was buried alongside her husband. At least he died okay. Penniless. But I mean, I think he was like being put up in a poor house it's like it's not good but he had shelter because even back then they knew homeless people needed shelter. around people you love I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah that's... yeah in 1999 a headstone memorializing the legendary poet was put in place which read william mcgonagall poet and tragedian they didn't make it rhyme <laughs> <laughs> below that i am your gracious majesty ever faithful to thee william mcgonagall the poor poet that lives in Dundee. There is also a plaque on 5 South College Street that commemorates where he died. From what I could tell, all his children lived their lives as mill workers in Scotland. To close, I would like to tell you my favorite poem of his. When a grieving couple asked McGonagall to write just four lines of poetry for their recently deceased daughter's tombstone, this is what he came well, up did, with. Why do they do that? Do they just need a, <clears throat> do they need a laugh? I think they were poor. <laughs> Just don't buy one. Here lies little Mary Jane. She neither cries nor hollers. She lived but one in 20 days and cost us $40. <laughs> oh, my God. Dude. What the fuck? Woo! <laughs> oh, my God. That's so fucked up. That's amazing. That was worth this whole thing just to fucking hear that shit. Uh, I gotta find that fucking grave. <laughs> that's gotta be like memorialized gotta, in fucking we, bronze. That's gonna be the Caleb. That's that's definitely a stop on the Caleb can't read tour. <laughs> it's gonna happen. Oh my fucking god. My sources today, William McGonagall, Collected Poems by William McGonagall, Berlin Limited, 2006, Patrick's People. Scott, and Wikipedia. You can look up our sources at the Caleb Can't Read Sources page on Facebook. You can follow us at Caleb Can't Read on Twitter. You can email us at uh, Caleb Can't Read at Some, gmail.com. Someone please. <laughs> okay, I hadn't seen the Twitter page because I don't give a shit for like for literally this entire fucking time. And then I went and looked at it and it's just Jordan screaming at the void. And he is giving 110%. It is the saddest fucking thing, dude. Oh my fucking God. Okay, I'm not like, don't, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm not gonna be that dude who like, <laughs> begs for and feels entitled to actual support or interaction but do yourself a favor and go look at how fucking sad that shit is <laughs> holy fuck it's funny yeah everyone continue <laughs> like, not to like any status and that's just gonna make it better <laughs> it's just this fucking plaque it's just this whole just board of despair <laughs> like Oh my god, he's, uh, he's giving it to him. I remember you calling <laughs> like, me and being like, well, I finally looked at this, and uh, boy, dance like nobody's watching. <laughs> so, like, 
dude. Yeah. Oh, it's fucking amazing. Dude, I mean, yeah, it takes no. 30 seconds out of my time to put it up. It's like, well, I might as fucking well. No, Everyone no, else don't, does don't it. fucking act like it's casual. No, those those are thought out little bits, little right. tweets. Yeah, I am You're correct. Totally right. I know you, bitch. <laughs> but, like, yeah, and about um, about last week, if anyone was curious as to the absence of the episode, um, we Jordan wrote out a good episode. It was only like a half an hour long, and the subject matter, we thought we could actually bring somebody else in um, to kind of expand on a little bit. And we will. I and just will. need to actually get to doing that, which yeah, I haven't. <laughs> for the few of you out there that are liking and following this, we figured that you would care more about quality content than just a schedule of release. So we'll have it out at some point, but... They're yeah. fucking tracking my IP right now like you didn't put out fucking <laughs> son of a bitch son of a bitch whatever uh, our fuck. demographic is now uh, it's uh was it like 28 to 34 year old men <laughs> most likely I mean it changes like site per site that you look at it is right? really weird to see what our demographic listens to <laughs> you know it's like, <laughs> like who the fuck is Doja Cat like <laughs> there's a lot of Taylor Swift in here that's weird <laughs> you got anything to add um um, no, we're going to go ahead and hit that. All right.